the most marginalized um, and vulnerable people in our society. And, um, but I do hope that, um, you know, I can um, share with you what my experience has been being a social worker at the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, I wanna just kind of sh uh, share it with you through um, telling you some stories about my work. And I hope in that process that I'll answer some of the, the questions um, that were posted yesterday. Um, so I'm gonna, and then of course there will always be the Zoom challenges, but okay, here we go. So I'm gonna just start by um, talking a little bit about um, the Equal Justice Initiative, um, our origins and how I came to EJI. Um, so this is a photo of our office in downtown Montgomery and uh, just kind of interesting note that um, you can see we have this beautiful bold sign on the front of our building, but we um, did not have a sign on our building until maybe five years ago. Um, so we have a very um, dominant presence in Montgomery now, but until about five years ago, we did not advertise the location of our office because of the hostility toward us. Um, our director has routinely received death threats throughout our work. Um, and um, it's, it's only been in recent years with the increased um, attention, uh, national attention to the need to reckon with our history of racial injustice um, that we have um, been more welcomed in our community in uh, Montgomery um, and felt safer um, advertising our location. Um, so uh, we, we've been in Montgomery, Alabama for about 30 years. Um, we started as a, as a, a very small um, law office um, focused on um, providing legal representation to uh, people on Alabama's death row. So, um, you know, every state in the United States has its own criminal justice system. And um, in Alabama, um, you know, there, there is no statewide public defender system. Uh, we've had some increase in um, the availability of some public defender offices um, in Alabama, but um, there is no, no system of defense uh, for the indigent in Alabama. Um, and we try to fill this one spot uh, addressing the lack of uh, availability of representation for individuals on Alabama's death row. In the time that we uh, began this work, um, uh, mass incarceration occurred. Um, and we have over the years in, um, expanded our focus to include other forms of excessive sentencing. Mass incarceration has not been driven by um, an increase in crime in the United States. It has been a, a policy choice um, to address a whole range of social issues through the use of incarceration. And one of the reasons mass incarceration has occurred is because of the increased use of really long sentences. Um, and so that has been an area that we have focused on challenging. And you can see from the photo of our, of our, our staff now. So when I started at EJI in 2008, there were about 10 of us. Um, and now you can see from this photo, there's, we have, I think about um, 35, 40 um, staff, not including um, our staff who run our, um, our sites. Our, um, we have a museum that we opened a couple of years ago called um, um, the Legacy Museum um, that covers the history of, um, from, from slavery to mass incarceration. Um, and then we also have our, uh, our memorial, our national memorial to peace and justice, which is a memorial to victims of racial terror lynchings from the end of reconstruction to World War II. And um, among the things that these two sites highlight is the ways in which the criminal justice system has on the one hand um, um, been, um, has, has over surveilled and overpunished African Americans, and on the other hand, underprotected African Americans. So all of these racial terror lynchings occurred either with the complicity of the criminal justice system or in the absence of it. Um, white mobs were never held accountable for the killings of African Americans um, in these instances. And that is this history 
that we are, are highlighting with our sites is part of a, a, a project that we've, we've always engaged in, um, but always on a much smaller level until recent years when we've um, received quite a bit of attention and funding to allow us to provide these sites. But part of our work, so we provide you know, um, legal representation um, to people who, who are facing excessive sentencing and cannot afford uh, representation. But we also do public education and we've always done public education and some, most of it's kind of looked like this, like all of us who work at EJI um, uh, do presentations to interested community groups. Um, and we talk about the criminal justice system and we talk about our work. And we've seen this as a necessary and important part of our advocacy strategy um, because we truly believe that if people understood what was happening in the criminal justice system, they would not support these policies. That we think this is deeply offensive to any American sensibility. Um, that, that what is actually happening is not acceptable. Um, and so we think it's really important to let people know what is happening. And I think as, um, you know, as fellow social workers, I think you understand too, the, just the importance of, 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 of acknowledging the ways that the most marginalized and vulnerable people in our society are invisible, they are hidden, and, and that we are always working to bring um, their lives to the attention of a society that we think cares. <laughs> and we have to hold on to that belief that this society cares, this society would direct resources to um, address these issues if, um, if they knew. <laughs> and so part of, part of our work is bringing attention to these issues. Um, and so I'm going to also just, uh, this is a short video, and this is where Zoom's just going to go bonkers on me, I'm sure. I'm going to try and show this video. It's only three minutes. I'm, I'm also going to put the link in the chat um, just in case, um, I think I'm going to put it in the chat, just in case uh, yours, your, the sound or something is off. Just give me one second. Um, Please help me here. Okay. Oops. All right. Well, it's doing that. Okay. Let's stop that. Um, sometimes the sound does not work. But um, this is a video that we made about the project that I came to EJI to work on. Um, Mariah, is there, we cannot hear it. Is the volume all the way up? Is that any better?
don't think there's any dispute that uh, sentencing a 13 year old to life in prison without parole is unusual. It's uh, happened only twice, but not homicides, only nine times. But we also think that to say that any child is 13, when a child got a sentence of life in prison, is wrong. So um, that is um, one of our um, advocacy pieces. Um, we use um, a range of media to um, help people understand um, the different client groups that we serve and the different issues involved in um, criminal justice reform. Um, so we, you know, each year we, we put out um, videos, you can find them on our website. We put out um, all kinds of reports, um, both about the criminal justice system and about the history of racial injustice in the United States. Um, and again, we have our museum and our memorial. We do all kinds of speaking engagements. Um, and for us, this is um, critical to our legal work, um, critical to not only um, increasing the chances of having good outcomes in our um, legal cases, but also influencing policy changes. Um, I'm gonna uh, now talk about um, my role as a social worker at EJI and how I came there. And I'm, I'm gonna do this, I find it best to kind of do this just through telling a story about a client that I work with. Um, Cause it's, um, my work is so, varied and so particular to each client, um, but each client kind of offers a representation of the range of work that I do. So um, again, so we, we started this campaign to end life without parole for children um, in 2006. And this was a, um, a campaign that was guided by two main factors. One is the law and what was what we saw as legally viable strategy to address this um, form of excessive sentencing. And the other was data, the data on this population, which um, if you um, study the criminal justice system, you find that the data is, is not very good. Um, it's hard to access. It's um, inconsistent, it varies by state, it's very confusing. There is, as part of the recent efforts in criminal justice reform, um, such as the efforts we've seen recently around um, issues having to do with policing and um, um, 
police use of force, um, uh, an increased call for improved data in that area. Because without the data, there's it's very hard to hold people accountable. It's very um, there's very limited transparency in how our criminal justice system is working. And so part of what we do is we collect data um, in, because there are there is no centralized government system collecting this data. So we 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 were the first agency to go looking to see well who is getting life without parole as children. We were particularly curious to know how young our kids getting this sentence. Um, and I think we sort of reasonably assumed it would be like 17 year olds. But what we found were 13 and 14 year olds getting life without parole. And one of them was our client, Joe, Joe Sullivan. And Joe is, um, uh, Brian writes about him in uh, Just Mercy. And um, Joe's um, in some ways, a, a, you know, very ex exceptionally horrific case. And in some ways, very representative of what happens in our criminal justice system. Um, so Joe, uh, hang on a second. I'm talking to a whole bunch of people in the Close the door. Um, so Joe was, um, was arrested when he was 13 years old um, and sentenced to life without parole in a trial that lasted one day. Um, his parents were not there. His father had just dropped him off at the police station and um, he had an appointed attorney um, who did not present any mitigation in his case. Joe has um, an intellectual disability and you can see that he's also quite physically disabled. Um, and uh, this is in Florida. Joe had been um, kind of living back and forth between... Um, one of my Legos, yes, and, 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 and I got fire me, and, 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 and I can't find the axe. Okay, I'll help you when I'm done. Okay. Sorry, Lego emergency. Um, uh, so he was living back and forth between um, his mom in, um, in Mississippi and his dad in Florida. And um, in Joe's family, um, there's quite a bit of mental illness and intellectual disability. You know, he has a profoundly impoverished family. Um, they had been reported numerous times to Child Protective Services. Joe was failing in school. Um, and um, you know, Joe was known to the police because he would be found sleeping on the bench in McDonald's and climbing in the dumpsters behind restaurants to get food. And um, his parents were generally unavailable. Um, and none of this was presented um, at his trial. I learned all of this through our own investigations later. Um, um, and, and actually most of these, this search for records that we engaged in was, was partly in order to help us plan for his release and, and document his disability so that I could get him um, services upon his release, which is a, the other part of the story, which I'll tell later. Um, so um, at the time that Joe was arrested, um, and this is still true to some extent, we have a really hard time enforcing policies that um, require that prisons keep children separate from adults. But at the time, there were none of these policies. So Joe was just placed in a, a men's uh, maximum security prison uh, with adults, um, not separated. And as you can imagine, uh, Joe was um, uh, victimized um, by um, the guards and by the, the other prisoners um, quite extensively. Um, Joe had um, uh, really no, no protection in this environment. Um, Joe um, is, dis is physically disabled because of um, uh, multiple sclerosis that began to emerge in his 20s. He was not provided with any medical treatment to slow the progress of his disease. 
Joe also was the victim of quite a bit of physical violence and you can see quite a bit of scarring on his body and on his head. And we believe that this also advanced um, his loss of um, use over his legs. Um, so when I met Joe, um, uh, Joe and I are the same age. Um, we were both in our, our early 30s when we met and um, he, um, you know, had already been in prison for 20 years and um, was a wheelchair bound. Although um, at the time of my, my visits to Joe, they were still, the guards were still making him walk. Um, it took us a while to secure. So we did a whole range of advocacy for Joe in the prison to, to help um, sort of at least marginally improve his quality of life there. And he did not, he had not secured a, what's called a pass in, in, um, in Florida prisons. You have to have a pass for any kind of medical need. He did not have a pass for a chair. Um, and so um, when I first met Joe, um, my first visit to him, so I would go into the prisons as a legal visitor um, and, um, I, I was assigned to, so I, I joined EJI to work with this, this, this group of clients in particular, Brian thought that they needed additional support. And so I was, I was the first social worker hired at EJI and this was kind of an experiment. Let's see, let's see if, um, I, I can be useful to, um, to clients. And the idea was just that I would provide um, monthly support um, in, in person. So I visit, visit this client group and they're, they're all over the United States. So I was traveling all over, um, going to prisons all over. Um, all of my work was, was alone. I would, I would um, kind of go to these prisons off in various places. And I, I say this in past, and I still work at EJI. It's just there's a pandemic, so I don't go into prisons um, for the past year. But the idea is that I go and see clients once a month. Um, and in between, I, um, depending on sort of what sort of access they have to other forms of communication, I might talk to them once a week by phone or um, correspond by letter. Um, but the idea was to build relationships with our clients as they were, um, as we were challenging their sentences. The legal process is really, really slow. And so, um, you know, uh, uh, while Joe was incarcerated, the, it was about a 10 years that I was working with him while he was incarcerated while we were challenging his legal case. Now I've worked at EJI for 13 years and um, I still have some clients who are still incarcerated whose legal cases we have, um, we're continuing to challenge. Um, and um, so, <clears throat> um, uh, so I would, I would visit as a legal visitor, um, you know, and going into a, um, a men's maximum security prison as a young woman who's not a lawyer. Um, uh, and, and going regularly was very confusing to the guards. Um, and um, uh, sadly, you know, we have, we have 2.3 million people incarcerated and most of them do not receive legal visits. Um, you know, I would go into these prisons with, you know, a thousand men held there and I would be the only legal visitor. Um, I don't understand that. It, it baffles me um, that people are in prison because of legal cases, but they have no one helping them with them. Um, and so, so yeah, so the guards were often very confused about what to do with me, uh, how to think of me. That I was, there was a lot of suspicion directed at me. I've learned to be very careful uh, in how I present myself going into prisons. Um, sort of, uh, you know, I wear a business suit. Um, I, uh, I'm very careful, you know, at EJI, we, we very openly love our clients and we tell them we love them, we hug them. Um, we, um, they, you know, we have these very long relationships with our clients, they consider us family. Um, but I have to be very cautious in my demeanor um, going in. I've been accused a number of times of having inappropriate relationships with my clients. Um, and while, you know, that, that's not, it, that's annoying. <laughs> it also has real consequences. I've been banned from prisons and just not been allowed to go in and see my clients, which is very hard on them. Um, my visits 
were, you know, for many clients, they'd never received an in-person visit from anyone. And so um, uh, these, these visits held enormous importance for them. Um, and so I would go in and visit for two hours is usually what um, I felt like was kind of like, you know, I usually like I would drive for like eight hours and then I'd like wait around for an hour in the prison and then I'd get this two hour visit and then I'd drive eight hours more. Um, and sometimes you think like, well, shouldn't I stay longer? Like, could the visit be longer? But I found if I ever stayed longer, the, um, the guards just wouldn't tolerate it. And they didn't even like really two hour visits were a lot um, to accommodate. Again, they're just not set up for this. I'm usually like, so like this first visit with Joe, I, um, they escort me sort of deep into the, the prison campus and into this um, little building. I'm kind of shuffled down some hallways and stuck into a, an employee break room, you know, and throughout my visit, people are coming and microwaving their lunches and um, they just don't know what to do with legal visitors. There's no, there was no system for managing me. Um, and I remember my first visit with Joe um, and, and subsequent visits until we were able to get him the wheelchair pass, they would, they would um, make him walk. Um, and it's very, very hard. It, Joe can't walk at all now. And, and at that time when, when we were in our early thirties, he still had a little bit of control over his legs, but not a lot. Um, and um, at the time that um, I met Joe, he was in solitary confinement um, because um, um, the one of the consequences for some people of multiple sclerosis is you have limited control over your bladder. So um, Joe, like everyone else in the prison, was subject to random urinalysis. Joe was placed. Joe was told to submit urine. He couldn't. He, he just couldn't pee on command. They placed him in a holding cell and said, "We're going to hold you here." until he produced. He couldn't produce and he panicked and he scooped water out of the toilet and said, here it is. So then he was given a disciplinary and then he was placed in solitary confinement for a year. So this was because of um, this really arbitrary system and you know, combined with Joe's limited ability to navigate um, a complex system of rules, um, he found himself repeatedly getting into trouble um, and so part of our advocacy with Joe was kind of trying to help him learn the system of rules. It was partly us developing relationships with, I mean, and in Florida, they've moved prisoners from prison to prison all the time. So as soon as we develop relationships with one set of prison staff, he'd be moved. And so we'd start again. These relationships were always very tricky. We had to be careful what we complained about um, so as not to make things worse. Um, but a lot of our advocacy for him was sort of helping him learn these rules, helping him come up with strategies for responding to these things, us talking to the medical staff, um, us getting like, you know, have a doctor we consult with who submitted a letter on his behalf. We were eventually able to get him some um, medical care. Um, and, um, 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 so, um, yeah, and, um, so we were able kind of over time to just, again, kind of marginally protect Joe, increase his quality of life. I would, I, but sort of every step of the way was a, required a kind of reevaluation and, and, and new approach. So for example, um, you know, I started sending money to Joe's canteen so that he could get some extra food and purchase clothes. Um, but Joe, that in some ways made Joe kind of a target. Joe was easily talked out of his money. Um, and so we had to be very careful. Then how much should we, like, what is the safe amount to send? Um, how much do we help him manage this? So there's always this, you know, to require this really strategic approach to um, um, increasing his quality of life to the extent we could without making him a target. Um, being, but the, the main thing was sort of, you know, 
for these 10 years that we're challenging his legal case, it was important that we be present in his life, let him know that we are working on his case, that we are working to get him out, that there's a possibility of getting him out, helping him understand what that means, um, and then helping him live as safely as possible in this setting. Um, in addition to all of that, um, I also wanted to start preparing for Joe's release. And um, I wanted to know, I was trying to kind of figure out what is the service system in, in, in Alabama, in Florida, wherever. Like I just started looking across the country. I actually kind of just created this list looking state by state. Where could Joe get the kind of um, level of care um, that was also the least institutionalized um, possible when he got out. So I, I'm looking both at service systems and at funding systems. And um, what I found through this years long um, search of making calls and um, trying to you know, talk to as many people as I could who might know these service systems, trying to submit applications just to see what would happen what I found that was, you know, these services are, are limited anyhow, but when you add in the fact that he has a felony and has spent time in prison, nobody wants him. Um, nobody wants to serve him. Um, he, uh, I could not find anyone. I could not find a single organization willing to take him. Um, and generally it was recommended that I send him to some sort of agency that deals with um, what, what are called offenders. It's not a term that we use to describe our clients, but, um, uh, and even those services, there's very few of them and they don't cater to people with disabilities. Um, so what ended up happening, we got Joe's case to the US Supreme Court, we got his sentence overturned. And then what happens is, um, once this, once a sentence is thrown out, he has to go back to the original trial court um, to get a new sentence. And lo and behold, 20 years later, the, the same 25 years later, the same judge is a, is um, it, he has to go back in front of the same judge who sentenced him to life without parole. Um, and so this judge, um, and so part of my role was I, I testified about. Um, the services that um, we would be providing Joe and that we had been providing Joe, testified about Joe's um, experiences in prison and all of that. Um, but um, this judge um, wanted Joe to die in prison, um, still felt that he deserved to be there and um, attempted to give him as, as long a sentence as possible. Fortunately for us, we were able to kind of um, appeal further and um, and Joe was released in 2017 um, after I think 26, 27 years of incarceration. Um, now we had no place to send Joe and um, so we brought him to Montgomery. Um, fortunately, Joe was not on parole. Um, so there was no restriction requiring him to live in Florida. So we brought him to Montgomery to be with us and um, it took just an enormous amount of resources for us to um, find a place for him to live where we could provide care for him around the clock. And we, by we, I mean, I mean literally us, like our lawyers, our paralegals, our administrative staff. This is kind of how we do our reentry services. We, we our own staff, um, provide the care. And, you know, that meant sort of getting him connected to the medical care that he needed. We were taking him, so we're in Montgomery, we're taking him up to Birmingham to get um, the, the best kind of MS care he could get from UAB, um, apply, you know, get him SSI, get him kind of connected to the various service systems that he was eligible for. And in the meantime, see like, was there any viable long-term option for him? Because we can't sustain this. It wouldn't be something we could do lifelong for him. So in the midst of all this, I happened to be consulting with a church down in Florida who um, is a, there's a priest, a Catholic priest who was doing chaplaincy services in um, the prisons in Florida, was horrified at what he saw there and wanted to get the church involved in providing services for, for the men as they were being released. 
particularly men uh, who were disabled, which um, this priest was doing a, a lot of service um, for individuals in solitary confinement. There's an enormous number of solitary confinement cells in Florida. And he would just spend his time going uh, through those, those housing units, talking with the men and realizing so many of them had incredible disabilities and so many of them were just being released straight from solitary to the street. And so through my conversations with him, um, um, I, I, I convinced him to take Joe. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, Joe uh, was the first resident that, uh, at, a, at a home, which I will, I'll show you at the, at the end of, of my slideshow because it's a really nice note to end on. Um, though the, the primary point in this story is, is that this is no way <laughs> to provide services to 600,000 people leaving prison every year. I mean, the amount of resources, the amount of um, just sort of moving heaven and earth to care for a person, this is just not sustainable. It's not a, an approach to um, services that makes any sense at all, but it's the result of there being a complete absence of services for this huge population um, with enormous need. Not only are there not the services available, but there's enormous barriers to them accessing the just other services um, that, that it, like housing, like employment, um, uh, like um, nursing home care if that's required. Um, there's so much stigma. These are not just legal barriers. There's a lot of legal barriers, but there's just a lot of stigma. And um, part of why we do these talks and part of my mission in kind of going into academia as a social worker is to try to challenge this stigma. Um, it doesn't make sense. Um, and, um, you know, one of the best ways to challenge the stigma against this population is to meet Joe Sullivan. Um, he is uh, a remarkably loving, kind, wonderful human being um, and just such a joy to spend time with and, and, um, and everyone who meets him agrees. Um, and that's one of the things Brian talks about when you hear Brian's talks, he'll say, you know, what one of the solutions to what we're dealing with is get closer, get closer to people who are affected by this system and come to care about them. Um, so, okay, so I'm just gonna kind of go through um, some slides. I'm gonna try, sorry, I'm gonna try and wrap up here in just a few minutes. I'm just gonna go through a few slides with just some of the basic numbers um, that um, Joe's, um, Joe's experience kind of, I think, um, it illustrates some of these larger national trends that we that we see. So, a lot of people are really surprised to hear there's children in the adult criminal justice system. That there's children in adult prisons, but a quarter of kids who are are charged in the in the um, charged with an offense um, end up in the adult system. And there's no national minimum age for this. And we see enormous disparities um, in this. Um, and 62 percent of youth transferred to the adult system. Um, are children of color. Um, these are just some of the um, um, sort of basic statistics about um, what mass incarceration is. So in 1972, um, there were 300,000 people in US prisons and jails, and today there's 2.3 million. This is, again, not the result of an increase in crime. There are all kinds of predictions of increase in crime, and there's been fluctuations in crime rates, but um, they don't coincide with incarceration rates. And it's been shown, studies have shown that um, incarceration has done little to nothing to reduce crime. Um, the US has 5% of the world's population, but a quarter of the world's prisoners. Um, there's a one in 20 lifetime chance of being incarcerated um, for, for Americans as a whole, but for African-Americans, it's far higher. Um, and we spent billions upon billions of dollars incarcerating people um, in a system that, as uh, Brian points out in this quote, where um, wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. Um, 
And then these are just some images of the insides of um, Alabama's prisons. These are not old, I mean, I don't know what the date is on these photos, but this is exactly what they still look like. These facilities still look exactly like this. Um, this is the women's prison in Alabama. This is Tutwiler's notorious prison for women. Um, the the, the um, primary characteristic of all American prisons is overcrowding. People are just crammed into these spaces. Um, these were prisons built um, for a much smaller population. Um, they are understaffed, they are highly dangerous. The US Department of Justice um, is suing the entire State Department of Corrections in Alabama because of the horrifically dangerous conditions. That's, that's never happened before. Um, uh, the, you know, these are just horrible, dangerous places um, where there's really high rates of um, violence. There's really high rates of disease. Um, public health researchers have found that the rates of a whole range of chronic and contagious diseases are far higher in this population. We know that, um, um, that there's really high rates of mental illness. Um, my area of research has been tracking um, uh, the rates and not only of um, like traumatic stress disorders in this population, but the rates of trauma exposure, which are multiple times higher than in the general population. Um, there's a fair amount of research on this for women and I've been trying to extend this to men because 90% of the prison population is men. And um, the kind of the sociological research on this shows that Individuals who experience incarceration live in these lives of these contexts of violence. Um, uh, and so I, I'm trying to um, help um, the mental health profession and the social work profession reconceptualize this population. We tend to see them as people we're afraid of when I, I think they are people who live lives just in, in contexts of fear, that they are ex actually extraordinarily vulnerable and that we need to direct interventions toward that. Most interventions, most mental health interventions directed at this population are about changing them, making them less criminal. And I think we have to ask this fundamental question of if the population, the incarcerated population is majority individuals of color, um, what are we saying? That they are more dangerous um, than uh, the white population? We know that's not true. So why are we approaching interventions using that assumption. Um, the criminal justice system is a biased system. It is not reliable in its mental health diagnoses. Um, it is not a diagnostic system that we can rely on. Um, it is a system that is being used to address a range of issues having to do with poverty. And it's doing it in a, in a biased and highly punitive way. Um, and so, I, it sort of seems uh, my research and my work is sort of challenging these assumptions and looking to direct um, more humane interventions. Um, this is a um, dorm in an Alabama prison for people um, with um, medical conditions. And you can see just, I mean, it's just so dilapidated um, and so dehumanizing. Um, this is a solitary confinement cell in an Alabama prison. Um, we just had one of our clients um, die in one of these cells from hypothermia. It got so hot, um, he died. He was basically cooked to death in this setting. Um, they're profoundly neglected in these places. Um, uh, suicide is incredibly high. Um, and, and you can understand why. It's just the, the conditions are so horrific. Um, even if the individuals who are in these settings are dangerous, which has not been shown empirically to be true. There's no justification for treating human beings like this. Um, this does not improve public safety. Um, I also just, and this is just uh, something I kind of threw together. This is just showing that our, the, our, the poorest parts of our country have the highest rates of incarceration. So, um, you know, incarceration is used at varying levels by state. Um, and it does appear that the states with the highest levels of poverty are the ones using this type of intervention the most. Um, and I just think we need a fundamental um, reorientation 
to how we respond to the kinds of social issues, some of which are crime, but not all of them are. I mean, I think it's 70% of people who are incarcerated have substance abuse problem. Um, we need different interventions to address these issues. This is just um, a cruel way um, to address um, uh, the challenges faced by our most marginalized populations. Now I'm gonna end on this hopeful note. This is a picture of Joe. Joe is in the middle of this group of volunteers um, from the, the church that started this, this program. So that's Joe in the green right there in the middle. Um, and um, the, this is um, the, they, they, so this, the church bought this house in a um, residential area, which is unusual to find that, that they will get a, a nice house in a nice residential area, but it's, there's nothing institutional about it. I couldn't have wished for anything better for Joe. And um, these are volunteers from the church who, um, they, they do have a couple of staff at the house but it's mostly volunteers at the church who come and spend time with Joe, um, take him out into the community, help him get his medical uh, needs met. Um, and there's also a real commitment in um, this community that has formed around this program, it's called Joseph House, um, to understanding the criminal justice system, to understanding the history of racial injustice in Tallahassee, um, and really reckoning with that. And all of it's motivated by these beautiful relationships with Joe um, and, and, and that, it, that people have come to know him and be really deeply moved by what he's been through. Now I'll tell you, Joe is labeled a sex offender, which are the most vilified people um, uh, in our society. And um, Joe was treated like complete garbage throughout his um, time in prison and to see him embraced by this community, by people who love him, um, who um, want to care for him, who are moved by the suffering that he's experienced, I think is a really beautiful thing. And this priest has really kind of led this as, as, a, as an opportunity for the, the community to change, not for Joe to change. Um, and Joe, um, Jeremy has maintained his innocence throughout his incarceration. We have investigated his case. We think it's a complete sham. Uh, we do not think Joe is guilty. But I will also say, even if he was, he was a 13 year old disabled child. Um, no one should be treated this way. Um, so that is the, the hopeful note I wanted to end on. It, it just fills me with such joy to talk to Joe and hear um, how safe and comfortable and loved he feels in this community. Um, and they've promised to care for Joe for the remainder of his life. So um, I, you guys probably all know these resources already. Um, uh, this book, The Sun Does Shine is by one of our clients who was on death row and was exonerated um, and is a beautiful book. And yeah, he, he also, um, there's probably some recordings of him speaking too. He's a wonderful speaker. Um, and yeah, I guess that's my contact information. And now I'm gonna, I'm sorry, I had to kind of stop looking at the chats for just a second because I get too distracted between the chats and my little boy coming in to tell me about his Legos. Let me see. Um, Yes, so, so Sloan commented that it's the what happened to you versus what's wrong with you questions, which has as a, is a framing um, that has been advanced by um, research in trauma. And that's one of the reasons that I've really focused on that area. I mean, I, I didn't know much about criminal justice system and I didn't know much about trauma before I came to work at EJI and um, the necessity of learning about trauma was apparent from my first meeting with clients. And um, it's uh, the, the conditions that they live in are just, um, just conditions of chronic, repeated violence and threat. Um, so the statistics are on punishment for guards, workers who were involved in death problems for those who were imprisoned. Yeah, I mean, that's another, it's similar to the kinds of data that we are missing on um, 
um, police violence. This is not something that's tracked. It's covered up a lot. And I also want to say, and I want to be careful of, about not condemning people who work in corrections. Um, most prisons are placed in rural areas, in communities where people have very few employment options. And this is usually the best one. And you see in those communities that public health problems skyrocket as a result of workers having to work in these kinds of environments. These are profoundly dehumanizing environments. The workers are trained to dehumanize um, incarcerated individuals. And while many of them act abusively in these contexts, many of them don't. Many are just in a system that is horrible and are themselves being kind of crushed by this system. Um, and who, and, and often, as you would expect, and the people who, who find that they really care for the people who are incarcerated end up having to leave. They either have to leave because it's so horrible to work in this environment or because they're, they're pushed out. Um, there's, there's just a lot of pressure in these environments to behave badly. Um, uh, I'm looking at Sabrina's comment. Um, I appreciate it at the beginning you said EJ works on the assumption that if the general public understood what the system was like, they would be outraged and would fight for better solutions. Does EJI track resistance and change efforts in any way? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I, I, I think that we do, um, to the extent that we see more and more people interested in um, supporting our work um, in terms of, of offering donations, um, our donations have increased enormously since Brian's book came out with Just Mercy, which has allowed us to expand our programming. Um, we also see that we have had far more visitors to our museum and memorial than we ever expected. Um, and I don't know what the number is right now, and I'm, numbers actually, I, I can't really conceptualize them, but I just know it was far beyond anything we ever expected in terms of the number of visitors that we get. And the pandemic um, has, you know, really limited our ability to have people come and see our sites. Um, but we've tried to keep parts of, like the, our outdoor site, we've tried to keep parts of it open to some extent um, because there's just such an overwhelm of interest um, in, in engaging with these sites and with, with um, this narrative. Um, uh, what are some micro and or meso steps to contribute to this issue? So sure, so the, the, the micro level steps that I would, I would um, highlight would be the one that Brian talks about a lot is proximity. Um, bringing yourself and others closer to individuals who are directly affected by um, the criminal justice system and by incarceration, it brings just a whole new and unexpected perspective to what is happening. So people who are normally labeled with these very distancing labels, um, uh, offender, murderer, um, thief, whatever the, whatever the label is, prisoner. Um, when you meet somebody and you get to know them, you realize that, um, as Brian says, we're all far more than the worst thing we've ever done. Um, and you also realize, it, it, this just, I, I have found that over and over again, every client I have met through EJI has been somebody with the most heart-rending story of adversity. And that they didn't, if they, most of my clients actually are guilty. Most of them did commit the offenses they were charged with. But when you come to understand the profound contexts of violence that they were surviving in, you kind of think, how was a human being supposed to do better? Um, it's not to discount the harm that they did. And part of our work is also working with victims of violent crime, which also happen to be our clients. So this line between perpetrator and victim is so blurred. Um, and that's something I think that's hard for social work to, to reckon with also. We tend to be very focused on victims without realizing that victims and perpetrators often are the same people. Um, and to really open ourselves to that reality and the full humanness of our clients and of ourselves. Um, 
So uh, on the micro level, bring ourselves and others closer. Now, the thing is, as social workers, you're going to encounter people who have dealt with the criminal justice system. We just are. They're, they're everywhere. There's so many. There's millions upon millions of people. And because social workers serve people on the margins, you are going to encounter whatever area you work in, you are going to encounter people who've encountered the criminal justice system. And I would encourage you to question the labels being placed on them and question the um, immediate assessment and assumptions placed on individuals. I, I still do it myself. You know, I hear that somebody's been convicted of a crime and I'm immediately like, oh, okay, what did they, what, what, what did they do? And, and maybe I shouldn't trust this person. And I have to kind of step back and remind myself, I mean, we, we all have this ingrained in us, this belief that the justice system to some extent is, is responding to real things. Um, and, and just um, recognizing that it's a very biased system, that while it may be responding to real things, it's doing it in a very particular way that is actually quite contrary to social work practice and social work values. Um, <clears throat> The meso steps, I think, um, what I think about, um, I think about this model uh, at Joseph House, where, and, and this is something I've been trying to advance in my research as well, Individual, individuals who've experienced the criminal justice system, who've experienced incarceration, need um, um, therapeutic supports in order to um, heal and learn to cope um, especially if they've been institutionalized a long time. They need supports in learning to cope with the world outside an institutionalized context. They need financial support. Poverty is the main driver of most social ills. Um, and so um, all of these, these individual level um, interventions are necessary. But in my understanding of the problems created by um, our current criminal justice system, to me, the primary target is actually outside the individuals who are being incarcerated. It is not only our um, policies and service systems, it's our communities. And so I think about this Joseph House model, the primary target of intervention in just the Joseph House model is the community. It is asking the community to open its doors to the 600,000 people being released from prison and to stop discriminating against this population. Um, and to offer the supports and services needed. Um, it is, it is um, education, it is public education, and it is opening people's hearts and minds to the realities of this highly marginalized population. Um, and then just someone gave a little shout out to the sun to shine. Um, how do you, Mariah, how do you take care of yourself while working? working on some of this valuable work, social work and the experience in this job. That's such a nice question. And um, so, you know, I, I, it has been, you know, I mean, for all of us in doing social work, you know, our, the, oh, I'm, it's past 11. I will just say <laughs> that the most important thing for me, aside from doing all of the usual self-care stuff we all have to do, is actually, um, um, I, I, where I'm going to misphrase this, it's spiritual practice. And I don't mean like you have to be a religious person. I think though you do have to be a hopeful person. <laughs> and I think it is the um, very active, very sometimes disciplined <laughs> effort to remain hopeful and to hold on to that belief that if people knew they wouldn't do this, <laughs> if people were given different environments, given different chances, people would never support a system like this. Um, and that's hard when you're going into these prisons and you're being harassed and people are treating you like crap and even your clients are pissed off at you half the time, <laughs> you know, like there is just there's this, there's this, this wrestling, but um, always remain hopeful. And the thing that keeps me most hopeful is my relationships, um, particularly my relationships with my clients. I have found such profound um, love and joy and hope and meaning in those relationships um, and being with people who have faced the worst things I could possibly imagine in the world and still wanted to go on living. And, and, and still love people. Like that's, to me, that's crazy. <laughs> they still love people. They welcome me, you know, there's some random lady walking in the door wants to ask them how they're doing and what, what they're interested in. Like, 
you know, that they just, they're, they're still open. It's such a testament to the human spirit. So I'm going to stop there. And I see that there's 18 more messages and I'm very sorry I didn't get to them, but I don't want to keep you past your time because you have your own self-care to do today. <laughs> Mariah, thank you so much. Um, that was so insightful and enlightening and so honest. Um, and and so so hard, hard and hopeful, and um, uh, just so grateful for your work. So grateful for that model, um, that social work lens through which you're viewing this. I think, which is a reminder to all of us um, as we are engaging and work with clients um, to not forget their humanity and their dignity. Um, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. So you. Oh, that's that's so nice. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, and all well, these thanks. other all these other messages are just like we love you so much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, so for, nice. every, for everybody on the call, I will email out um, the recording and the the PowerPoint, the PDF, so that so that you can resource those slides, reference those slides, um, and Mariah's contact information will be on there. So if you have questions that pop up or, you know, she also gave some resources in her PowerPoint presentation. So I encourage you to, to check those out as well. But um, thank you so much, Mariah. And thank oh, you. Thank you, everyone. So, so nice to talk to you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much.